Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the last of our three super polycons. Most of you attended the other two polycoms and were quite pleased with how informative they are. And you are not going to be disappointed today. Our in-house expert for today's presentation is Dr. Diane Woolard, Director of Surveillance and Investigation with our Office of Epidemiology. On a day-by-day -day basis, she manages the EPI components of our Emergency Preparedness Grant. And today she's going to brief us on biological threats in Virginia, the public health implications of them, and how VDH would respond in a biological emergency. So without further ado, Diane, thank you again and again for agreeing to speak with us this morning. You have our undivided attention. Thank you, Nancy, and thanks for everybody who's attending. Uh, do let me know if you can't hear me for any reason. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about biological threats. I am going to have to motor through this. I have packed a lot of information into the talk. Um, I will tell you now what I want to cover. I'm going to focus a lot on the disease transmission cycle. I'm going to spend some time developing that model and then carrying it through um, to the rest of the talk. I'll touch briefly on how we detect disease activity and how we define what the appropriate disease prevention measures are in light of the disease transmission cycle for each disease. I'll go over the six category A agents of bioterrorism and talk uh, then at the end about the public health response to disease incidents and then end with giving some resources for more information. So this is the disease transmission cycle. Um, it's four communicable diseases, so it starts with an agent. The top um, box there is the agent, which is the organism that causes disease. It can be a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, um, any sort of agent that causes disease. And then the agent has to go through the steps in this cycle in order to cause disease in a, a susceptible host. So the agent lives somewhere, and the place that the agent lives is called the reservoir. The reservoir of disease, where the agent of disease lives, um, the reservoir is where the organism that causes disease lives. It can be in the body of a sick person. It can be in a rat, a flea, a tick. It can be in the soil. It can be in food or water. But it's important when you hear about an agent to think about where that agent lives. In order for the agent to cause illness, it has to leave the place where it lives, and that's called a place of exit or a portal of exit, and it's how the agent gets out of the reservoir where it lives. Then it has to go through a mode of transmission that that agent needs, enter a portal of entry of somebody else's body, somebody's body, into, and the host has to be susceptible for disease to occur. So all these steps have to take place for a communicable disease to be transmitted by the agent from where it lives, coming out of where it lives, through a mode of transmission specific for that agent, enter the body through a portal specific for that agent, and the host has to be susceptible. There are factors in the host that can affect its susceptibility. You can lower your susceptibility to disease by uh, having experience with that disease before, and maybe you're immune from it now because you've had it before, or to be vaccinated against it, you can be less susceptible. You might be more susceptible to disease due to some factors, such as being very young or very old, having problems with your immune system. This disease transmission cycle is very, very important for public health because if we can break that cycle anywhere along the way, we can prevent disease. So this is our, our purpose, is to figure out what we know about the disease and where we might be able to break the cycle in order to prevent the occurrence of disease. So there are things that we do in public health uh, that interrupt this disease transmission cycle. Um, providing clean air, water, and food will keep the reservoirs free of um, the agents. Keeping hands clean can, can prevent the mode of transmission. Keeping sick people away from well people and covering your coughs will keep that agent from being transmitted 
out of the uh, sick reservoir, a sick person at, serving as a reservoir um, into the body of another uh, person. Three things can lower your susceptibility of the host, um, but keep people healthy. You've got a strong immune system. Vaccines or preventive antibiotics are used sometimes. Um, and personal protective equipment can put a barrier so that the organism cannot enter your body. And then um, controlling uh, ticks and mosquitoes and things like that or other ways that we can interrupt this disease transmission cycle. And it's our job to look for measures we can put in place to prevent the spread of disease. So what happens is we will hear about an agent of disease. We'll either know the agent because the lab has identified and confirmed the agent that's causing disease, or we can guess what it is based on a scientific educated guess, based on the symptoms the person is presenting with that clue us into what the disease might be, or other available information such as where they've traveled or what they've been exposed to. So we do the best we can to identify the agent and then our minds naturally go to this disease transmission cycle and we start thinking, okay, what are the potential reservoirs for that disease? Where does it live? And can we find them and prevent exposure to those reservoirs? How is this disease transmitted? Is it transmitted from person to person? What can we do to halt the spread of disease? Thinking through that disease transmission cycle to make sure the agent cannot pass through the portal of entry into a susceptible host so that we're doing what we can to prevent disease. Ways we hear about disease activity can be calls from the concerned public. Um, maybe they attended a group meal or some other setting and a bunch of people are sick and they can call us up. We get reports from medical care providers. Um, they can call or they can report on paper through the regular disease reporting process. And I wanted to take the opportunity here to say how fantastic lab reporting is and if it wasn't for the labs we wouldn't know much about what's going on with disease in Virginia and the hospital infection preventionists are also great eyes and ears for us um, to learn about disease activity. We can monitor our reportable disease data that's coming in to look for any trends and patterns and spikes and see if something unusual looks like it's going on. We can monitor our emergency department and urgent care center data for similar trends and patterns and spikes. And sometimes we'll get alerts from other states about outbreaks or disease situations going on or from CDC, other federal agencies or international agencies. I want to just take a second to make sure everyone's familiar with the regulations for disease reporting and control. Those regulations say what diseases need to be reported to the health department, who has to report them, how you report them, when, where you report them, and why. Their link at the bottom of the left column shows uh, how to get to the regulations for your reading pleasure. And then on the right-hand side is the reportable disease list for Virginia. It's a key means by which we learn about disease activity. One reportable condition is any unusual disease of public health concern. So that's kind of opening the door for anything that seems strange to come to the attention of the health department. So the reports of disease usually go to the local health department and then staff interview the physician to learn all they can about symptoms, uh, dates, lab tests, lab results, um, anything they know about the patient and whether the patient knows about the disease or the diagnosis. Then they call up the patient and ask similar questions about the disease history and any exposures. We want to confirm that the disease is really what we think it is, um, facilitate lab testing if necessary, and learn all we can about exposures the person might have had, what put them at risk for getting this disease. And we also want to look at what their risk factors are for potentially spreading it to others. We want to identify and protect their contacts and make recommendations to prevent the spread. So these are common uh, disease agents I won't go through each one, just wanted to make the point that for each disease, you have to think about this disease transmission cycle, how it gets out of a body, how it's transmitted, and how it can enter somebody else's body to cause disease. These three diseases are tr transmitted in very different ways. So if I have influenza, I sneeze, you inhale droplets that, from my sneeze, you can get flu, but if I have salmonella, and I sneeze on you, 
you're not likely to get salmonella from that because salmonellosis has to be uh, ingesting the organism. So it's really important when you think about the agent of disease to think again about the reservoir and how it's transmitted um, and what we can do to put into place to, again, if we can break that cycle of disease transmission, we can prevent disease. These are pictures that I saw when I was making an earlier version of the talk. Don't try to make sense of them. I just liked them and didn't want to lose them. It's, I do have a nice little susceptible host and a nice reservoir and a, a good agent, but the ones at the bottom are really look more like multiple modes of transmission than really being the items in the cycle. Just wanted to make the point of you break the cycle, you prevent the disease, and everything is agent dependent. So I want to shift now to the biological agents of concern for terrorism. These are called uh, CDC's Category A bioterrorism agents or diseases. These diseases are not necessarily the ones that are most likely to be used for bioterrorism, but they are of great concern because they cause severe illness, they can cause widespread illness and death. They can be disseminated widely, such as in an aerosolized form over a larger geographic area, and some of them can be spread person to person. A number of them cannot, and we'll mention that for each one. They would have a large public health impact in that we would be trying to find all the cases, vaccine, vaccinate people, give antibiotics out. Um, it would have a huge impact on the medical care system, likely to flood, flood the medical care system. There would have a lot of social disruption, a lot of fear, um, and we, we would have to be prepared to respond to these. So these are considered the Category A agents. There are other agents of concern for terrorism, um, but these are the six you usually hear about. What I plan to do is say four points for each disease. You will not become an expert on the disease from what I'm going to say. I will give you a very brief overview of what the disease looks like, just to give you a flavor of the disease, not a lot of detail. Um, there's just not time for that. I want to present each disease in the context of the disease transmission cycle. I have not seen this done before. It was just an idea I had, and I am carrying it out in this talk. So I have to tell you, you are uh, subjects of experimentation here. I hope it works um, to show how these diseases work in nature. It might not work uh, as easily as the cycle just appeared because these diseases tend to have multiple forms. They have multiple reservoirs, multiple routes of transmission, and multiple forms of disease depending on how the agent enters your body. So it's not as straightforward as the influenza and salmonellosis examples would lead you to believe, but I'm hoping um, that it will be uh, illustrative of how these agents uh, live in nature and how they can cause disease. Then I want to highlight methods of prevention for each one and then how the disease would look um, if it was the result of a terrorist act. I was going to put a fifth point in for each disease about how we would respond to them, but what I found, found myself doing was putting the same thing on each slide. So I decided to just group the public health response at the end of the talk because the components of how we respond to any of these agents are very similar. In fact, they're similar not just for these agents, but for other biological agents, as well as chemical agents, radiological, nuclear. What public health does to respond to any bad thing um, is very similar. So I'll be talking at the end about the public health response to diseases in general. Okay, so I'm going to start with anthrax. I have three bullets here because there are three forms of anthrax. But this is where you can laugh and say, uh, really, Diane, this is what you're going to tell me about anthrax. This does not do justice to this disease. It is a very severe disease. Um, there are other symptoms that would be going on with any of these forms. These are just kind of the hallmark signs of the different forms. There's inhalation. Um, where you breathe in the uh, anthrax spores. It causes severe 
breathing problems. And if you look at the x-ray, that wide white area between the rib cages is kind of a classic feature to look for on x-ray to diagnose inhalation anthrax. It's called a widened mediastinum. If you had inhalation anthrax, you would also have fever and sweats and pains and headaches and muscle aches. You would feel really <coughs> bad. Um, and you would have a non-productive cough, which is uh, important later. For cutaneous, a painless lesion with a black center, it shows in the picture. But it's not like you look down at your arm and say, oh, look, there I have a painless lesion with a black center. You would have swelling around the lesion. You could have a fever. You could have swollen lymph nodes. You will feel bad. It won't just be a surprise to have this lesion. During the anthrax of 2001, people with spider bites went to the hospital concerned that they had cutaneous anthrax because they appear similarly. But this is, um, that picture shows what a cutaneous lesion for anthrax would look like. Ingestion anthrax is uh, not very common. Um, it could cause nausea and vomiting, bloody diarrhea, ulcers along the GI tract, again, fever. Um, it can go into the, a bloodstream infection. So these are um, serious diseases, and these bullets don't do it justice, but it gives you kind of the uh, classic signs to look for as <laughs> indicators of this disease. Now, in the disease transmission cycle, this is what anthrax looks like. It's caused by a bacteria called Bacillus anthracis. Bacillus anthracis lives in animals such as cattle, sheep, goats, and camels, mostly in other parts of the world like South America, Asia, and Africa. Um, the bacterials in the spore form can live in the soil as well. So it gets out of that reservoir through the skin, hides, and wool of infected animals. Um, and then you can, the mode of transmission is contact with the infected animals or their products or with the soil. Also inhaling the spores or eating undercooked meat. So it shows there are three modes of transmission because there's three forms of disease. If you have the contact on your skin with the animals or products or the uh, soil, it can cause a cutaneous form. If you inhale the spores, it enters through your lungs. It can cause inhalation anthrax. And eating undercooked meat can have the bacteria enter your GI tract. And then you get sick um, based on how it enters your body. So if we had this disease reported to us, we would want to know what form of the disease is so that we would ask different exposure questions of the person to say, well, if it's the GI kind, um, what did you eat? If it's inhalation, where have you been that you breathed in contaminated air? And then if it's cutaneous type, what have you, have you touched? So there are questions that we would want to ask would depend on the um, form of the disease because it's different exposures um, resulting in different forms of the disease. So the prevention is largely, uh, again, with a focus on how these diseases occur in nature. In parts of the world where this disease is common, they can vaccinate livestock. People who work in areas where animals are commonly infected would be educated about protective clothing they should be wearing, how they should dispose of carcasses, how they can disinfect the products that, they, that are made from the animal hair or wool. Good thing about this disease is it's not spread from person to person, so standard precautions are all that's required in healthcare. Standard precautions are the precautions that are supposed to take for, be taken for all patients at all times. It involves good hand hygiene all the time, and then appropriate use of gloves and masks and gowns um, if there is expected to be contact with blood or body fluid. If there was a, a larger scale exposure, public health might be involved in de decontaminating exposed people. If it was, say, aerosolized, like in a post office, um, or giving antibiotic prophylaxis to those that are exposed. There is a vaccine for anthrax, but it is very limited in use, um, largely to people with occupational risks, such as lab workers or people in the military. If it was terrorism, we would see uh, severe 
acute febrile illness, people with fevers and the sort of aches and, and overall malaise and everything that occurs with fevers um, that progress to a, the course of a very severe disease and death. The lab would be saying they're seeing gram-positive bacilli and the chest x-rays would show that widened mediastinum, that wide white area. Of course, anthrax has been used as a terrorist agent in 2001. We had the spores that were in the letters in the United States and we resulted in 22 cases. Half of them were inhalation and half were cutaneous. We had two inhalation cases in Virginia residents. Um, fortunately, both of them survived. Before 2001, the last inhalation anthrax case was in 1976. But there have been some cases since. And the last case was in Florida in 2011, and that was written up in the February 2014 Emerging Infectious Disease Journal. It was a man who traveled to parts of the United States where anthrax can occur naturally, um, but they were not able to find the source of his infection, but they did believe it was naturally occurring. In Virginia, we have not had any cases since 2001. It's relatively rare in the United States. You think of it as um, people who are handling imported hides or uh, wool or rugs. Moving on to botulism, it also has multiple forms of the disease. We tend to think of the foodborne botulism, but the intestinal or infant form is more common. So the foodborne botulism results from ingesting the toxin in contaminated food. The classic feature of botulism is a descending paralysis. So think of it as stopping, starting at the top of your head and working its way down. So the first thing to be affected are your eyes, and you can have blurred vision or double vision, and then it can move down. Uh, your body so that you would then have difficulty swallowing, difficulty talking, and then difficulty breathing. The intestinal form used to be called infant botulism, and most of us still call it infant botulism, but it really is intestinal botulism because it's not just infants that get it, um, but adults that have altered um, anatomical features in their bowel or altered microflora in their bowel can get this as well. And the symptoms here are constipation, poor feeding, poor reflexes. Um, it's a floppy baby syndrome. Um, it can also be a cause of sudden infant death syndrome. Wound botulism is pretty rare. Um, it occurs when wounds are contaminated with the spores that have uh, contaminated soil. And inhalation does not occur in nature. It's what we would be concerned about for bioterrorism where you would inhale the aerosolized toxin and then it would affect your nervous system the same way the foodborne does. Botulism does occur naturally in the United States. In 2011, there were 153 cases reported. In 2012, in Virginia, we had two cases reported. Both of them were the intestinal form occurring in infants. So this is how it looks in nature. It's caused by a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum, and what we're worried about are the toxins that that bacteria produce. The, um, the bacteria goes into a dormant form in, in soil, and it can get out of its reservoir um, through the food that's grown in the soil or through a product such as honey. So the mode of transmission is you can consume the toxin in contaminated food which is lead to the foodborne kind with the portal of entry being the GI tract. You can ingest the spores. The portal of entry, again, is the GI tract, and that leads to the intestinal form of disease, or spores can enter your wound. It can enter the opening in the skin. For BT, again, we'd be concerned about the inhalation where it would enter your respiratory tract. People are generally susceptible to botulism, um, and infants are the most susceptible to the intestinal form. The way you prevent botulism is safe food preparation. We want to make sure that we boil home canned foods. There's not 
100 percent agreement on how long. I've seen three minutes, and I checked CDC said five minutes, so we'll stick with five minutes here. Um, it's recommended to not feed honey or corn syrup to infants. And if someone has foodborne botulism, we want to find uh, suspected foods that they consumed, and we want to make sure that nobody else can consume those foods. Public health is very involved in uh, procuring antitoxin for botulism. It's not really prevention. It's more tertiary prevention. It's not preventing the disease, but it can prevent the disease from progressing. Again, we're very happy to say that this disease is not spread from person to person, and standard precautions in health care are sufficient. If it was terrorism, what we would see is people ha uh, being diagnosed with this descending paralysis. It's classic for um, botulism. The lab might report that they saw they were confirming botulism with an unusual toxin type where we might be more likely in nature to see A and B and they might see these other kinds of toxins. We could have an outbreak of botulism in an area and we not be able to find out any foods in common among the people who were affected or we could have multiple simultaneous outbreaks and find no common source. Plague, again, all of these diseases have multiple forms. There's bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. A bubo is a swollen, painful lymph node. So bubonic plague is uh, characterized by having these buboes, or swollen, painful lymph nodes. Also, with this disease, you'd have fever, headache, weakness, and chills. Pneumonic means it's affecting your lungs. It's a sudden onset. You have a high fever with headaches and chills and a productive cough. So anthrax had a non-productive cough. Plague, pneumonic plague, has a productive cough. And you can cough up watery or bloody type substances. And this can rapidly progress to severe respiratory illness. Septicemic means the organism is in your bloodstream. Fever, chills, headache, abdominal pain, bleeding into the skin or organs. This can progress to shock, meningitis, coma. Bubonic plague can progress to septicemic. Bubonic or septicemic can affect the lungs. So these can occur in a cycle. We haven't had any cases of plague in Virginia since the 1800s, but it does occur in the United States, in the western states. So in 2011 in the United States, three cases were reported with two from New Mexico and one from Oregon. So it can occur naturally in the United States, but not in our part of the states. How it looks in the disease transmission cycle is it's caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. Um, we're concerned here about rodents and small mammals being the host for fleas. And this means uh, rats and squirrels, prairie dogs, and rabbits are the kind of hosts we're concerned about. And then the fleas feed on these infected animals and can transmit the disease to people. Or you can also become infected by directly handling the infected animal, their tissues, or being bitten or scratched by the animals. The pneumonic form can be spread by droplets that come out through coughing or sneezing. So the portal of entry can be the uh, site where the flea bites you, or inhaling, it comes into your lungs, or come in through a break in your skin. People are susceptible to plague. The prevention measures are mostly geared toward parts of the world where the disease is more common and there's more of a problem with rodent and flea infestations. So the thing is, if you're traveling in particular, uh, reduce your contact with fleas and rodents or infected animals. Um, treating clothing and bedding of a, a patient um, to kill the fleas. And here you need some extra precautions in healthcare if it's pneumonic plague. In addition to standard precautions, which you use for the other forms of plague, if it's pneumonic, you um, put the patient in isolation and use droplet precautions, which pretty much means you put a mask on when entering the room and have a private room wherever possible. Here, public health has a role if it was large scale um, aerosolization and we had a, a large problem. We might do large scale antibiotic distribution. Um, on a smaller scale, for any case, we want to find the contacts if it's pneumonic plague. 
um, and put them under surveillance. Um, and if they develop illness, we want to get them into health care and into isolation quickly. We, this might be an instance where public health would quarantine contacts, which means we'd restrict the activities of people even if they're well, um, just to make sure that they're not going to get sick and transmit the disease further. If it was terrorism, we would start to see plague in parts of the country or the world where the disease is not usually seen. We would see cases in people that don't have the kind of risk factors or exposure history that we would expect to see. They haven't traveled to a part of the world where the disease occurs naturally. They don't have any known exposure to rodents and fleas. Or we could see suddenly an outbreak of illness with uh, people having severe pneumonia and sepsis. Um, we could suspect plague as a terrorist act. We don't want to see that. And this is one we really don't want to see, smallpox. Smallpox we like to see as a public health success story um, that the vaccine really did enable the World Health Organization to proclaim this disease as eradicated. The last disease, the last case in the world was in 1977. The last case in the United States was 1949. And the last case in Virginia was 1944. Smallpox um, starts with fevers and aches before you develop a rash. And the rash starts in the mouth and on the face and then spreads to the arms and legs and then to the rest of the body. The lesions progress to different stages, um, becoming vesicular or filled with a fluid and then filled with pus, pustular form, all in one part of the body will be in the same stage of development. There are three really key points to these factors to keep in mind because they differentiate smallpox from chickenpox, which would be the most likely disease to be confused with smallpox. One is the fever and aches before the rash occurs with smallpox. It does not occur um, with chickenpox. And then thinking about put it starting with your head and then draw a circle like it's a clock face around your body. That's how the smallpox rash would spread. It would start on your face, go to your arms and legs before it would affect your trunk, where chickenpox is going to be affecting your trunk more. And also, if you look down at a part of your body, all the uh, lesions would be in the same stage of development, where with chickenpox, you might have some that are new lesions and some that are healed lesions all in the same part of the body. So there are three really key things to differentiate smallpox from chickenpox. So this is the first virus we've talked about, it's a variola virus. It only lived in humans. Um, there are no animals or insects involved here. And now we hope to goodness that it is contained in two World Health Organization labs and nowhere else. In nature, it occurred, um, it would get out of the human body reservoir through lesions on the skin or through respiratory droplets. To a much lesser degree, it could be spread through contact with contaminated clothing or bedding or airborne transmission. Um, so you would have contact with lesions or the fluid from the lesions or respiratory droplet that would then enter through your skin or uh, respiratory tract to cause illness. The vaccine reduced people's susceptibility, but the vaccine was last given in 1972, so people are now susceptible. So vaccine is the key method of prevention. If anybody got this disease, they would be put into strict isolation immediately, had to have very careful handling of clothing, bedding, medical waste, laboratory specimens, et cetera. And here we are jumping up to even higher levels of precautions in healthcare. We would make sure they're in an airborne isolation room. People would have to be wearing N95 respirators, um, gloves and gowns, et cetera. We would be very keen on identifying all cases and all contacts. Uh, contacts would be under surveillance and we would definitely want to quarantine them to make sure we can contain the disease as much as possible and there would be uh, widespread vaccination occurring. A single case of this disease would be a national and international public health emergency and we don't know of a way that this would occur other than through terrorism. Tularemia, I'm not even going to try to talk about all the different forms of this disease. Um, 
one, I do want to say that with any of the forms of the disease, you'd be having the febrile illness. So you'd have fever, chills, muscle aches, headaches, joint pain, weakness, all that stuff that comes with having a fever. And then it causes a number of different forms of disease depending on how the organism enters your body. Classically, you would have some swollen glands and you may or may not have ulcers on your skin. This does occur in the United States and in Virginia, naturally. In the U.S. in 2011, there were 166 cases. In Virginia in 2012, we had two cases. Both of them had rabbit contact. And um, in 2011, we had a big year of six cases in Virginia. In nature, um, tularemia is caused by a bacteria called Francisella tularensis, which I think is about the prettiest name of a bacteria I've ever heard of. Um, the reservoir where this agent lives is in wild animals. Classically, you hear about it in rabbits. It also can occur in ticks and deer flies in our area. In other parts of the country, it can occur in mosquitoes as well. So the route of exit from the, the reservoir is through meat or hides of infected animals or for bite and fly, tick and b fly bites. Ooh. So there are a lot of different modes of transmission and a lot of different portals of entry. Because there are a lot of different forms of the disease, it can enter your body in different ways. So ways it can be transmitted is through skinning wild animals. This classically is a disease you hear about occurring in hunters who are skinning rabbits. You can get it by handling or eating uncooked meat from infected animals. You can get it by handling pelts and paws, that lucky rabbit's foot. You can get it by drinking contaminated water, the bites of arthropods, or inhaling aerosols. Now that can be inhaling dust from contaminated soil or grain, or it can be through bioterrorism. People are susceptible. So the, in nature, the ways to prevent tularemia is by preventing the tick bites or fly or mosquito bites by wearing long sleeves and using repellents. Avoid drinking, swimming, or bathing in untreated water where the disease is common. Wearing gloves when you skin animals, especially rabbits. Not petting that cute little wild bunny. Um, taking precautions in labs. I mentioned here in particular, but of course this is true for all of the BT agents. Um, but it is a risk factor we want to keep into in mind for uh, lab precautions for tularemia. This is another agent that we're very happy to say is not spread from person to person. Standard precautions uh, are sufficient, but if somebody has lesions, they should also use contact precautions. If it was terrorism, we would see people having this acute febrile illness with the fevers and aches, um, a number of them progressing to more serious upper respiratory symptoms and inflammation because we would be looking for aerosolized dispersal if it was to, um, bioterrorism, so we'd look for the respiratory form. The lab findings of gram-negative cacobacilli and then special uh, x-ray findings of infiltrates around the bronchi. Viral hemorrhagic fever is not one disease, but really dozens of diseases. Um, all of them live in animals or insects, and that the viruses occur in parts of the world where these animals and insects live. And the humans have to contact these uh, animals and insects to get infected. Some of them are spread from person to person, and I put an asterisk there. The arenoviruses, the filovirus, and the Nipah virus can be spread from person to person, but not all of them. These diseases do uh, are very rare in the United States. They occur mostly in Africa, so we would expect to see them as travel-related diseases, um, and the spread should be fairly limited thereafter. They're not going to be easy to spread with good precautions in health care, prevention of needle sticks, not sharing needles between patients, and using the barrier precautions um, should prevent the spread of disease. I want to explain what it is by breaking down the, the name of the condition or category of conditions viral hemorrhagic fever. So one, it's caused by vi viruses. Hemorrhagic means bleeding of some sort is involved. 
This can be bleeding under the skin, it can be bleeding in the organs, and it can be bleeding out of openings. So you're looking for some hemorrhagic signs of illness and fever, they're, they're febrile illnesses. Um, clearly, we're some of these words, there are a lot of different kinds of viral hemorrhagic fever. If you look at this slide, some words should be ones you hear about sometimes, like Ebola, Marburg, Lassa fever. Um, there is an Ebola outbreak currently going on in Guinea and Liberia that we're, we're watching. So there are the disease transmission cycle. There are five groups of viruses. Used to be four. There's just been one that's been added. Uh, again, they live in arthropods, meaning mosquitoes, ticks, and sand flies, or in rodents, meaning rats and mice. So they exit their natural reservoirs through the mosquito or tick bite or through the urine or feces of the rodents. And you get this disease by the bites of the tick or mosquito or by contact with the urine or feces of the rodent or inhaling dried urine and feces. And sometimes direct contact with the ill animal or the person can transmit the disease for those that are person-to-person -person spread. Portal of entry then is the skin or the respiratory tract. And people are susceptible, but you have to pretty much be in an area where you have these infected rodents and mosquitoes and ticks to get these diseases. So prevention is through avoiding contact with the infected rodents and arthropods, hand hygiene, and this we have some extra precautions that are taken in healthcare. Um, especially for those that are person-to-person -person spread, the arena viruses and the filoviruses, or if the virus is unknown, that you take extra precautions like double gloving and wearing uh, special gowns, doing some disinfection, taking a lot of laboratory precautions for this disease. If there were contacts of people um, with a viral hemorrhagic fever, we would want to identify them, put them under um, surveillance, do surveillance of laboratory workers who have handled any specimens from patients. And here I'd like to ask you to change antibiotics to antimicrobials. We're not really using antibiotics for a viral infection. I'm sorry about that. Um, but ribavirin is an antiviral medicine that can be used for certain kinds of viral hemorrhagic fever. There is a vaccine for yellow fever for people traveling to certain parts of Africa and South America as well. If it was terrorism, we would see patients um, coming down with different viral hemorrhagic fevers or the same viral hemorrhagic fever that did not have a travel history to a part of the world where the disease naturally occurs or not have the kind of exposure we're looking for. We'd be seeing high fevers, severe illness, and these hemorrhagic manifestations like bleeding under the skin, bleeding out of the nose, vomiting blood, having blood in the stool, bleeding in your lungs, terrible, scary diseases. But again, we would expect uh, spread to be limited in the United States due to good precautions in healthcare. So what would we do if we heard about a BT agent? We would want to make sure we found everybody who could potentially have one of these diseases um, we would want to gather all the information we possibly could on the illness. We would do a lot of filling out forms, of extensive data collection on the illness, review of medical records. We would want to do lots of interviews to try to find their exposures. Um, we would want to get specimens to DCLS and or CDC, search for anybody um, who might have the illness. We would want to make sure we identify and protect contacts. We need to make sure the patient is under proper precautions. We want to find anybody else who might have the same exposure, so we have to find all their exposures, figure out what the agent is, where that agent lives, um, and do everything we can to prevent exposure to that agent in that reservoir or through that mode of transmission. We would do surveillance. There are times we would quarantine contacts, and we would take whatever action we can to prevent the disease. We could restrict people's activities give out vaccine and antibiotics. And our key product from public health is information, information, information. We'd have to put all the information together um, and tell people what's going on, who's at risk, and what they can do to minimize their risk. If we heard about any of these diseases, we would look for any potential natural cause that would explain the illness. 
Um, as soon as anybody in any part of the health department heard about one of these diseases, we would expect the Office of Epidemiology to be notified um, that we would want to work with you to make sure you have the resources you need, talk together with you about the types of information to collect, forms to fill out. Um, and then after you've done investigation, if you can't find a natural um, source, then you would be back in touch with us in the Division of Surveillance and Investigation. Um, we would have to become suspicious. We don't want to become suspicious, but we might have to. Um, we would be then responsible for informing up the VDH chain, notifying law, law enforcement and CDC. We would set up special surveillance system. We would send notices out to providers and labs about what symptoms to look for, what specimens to collect, what precautions to take. We would try to put out information for the public, and we might set up epi studies, and we would certainly be trying to find all cases, all contacts, um, and watch people for development of illness and making sure that they um, minimize their exposure to others. There would be a lot of collaboration for other parts throughout the agency with other parts of the agency and with healthcare providers and medical care, and certainly very much with DCLS and the lab. EPI operations we've defined in an EPI response plan. Um, it's a scalable operation, could be implemented for a single case in the district. It could be implemented for a giant case in, the, in lots of people in the world. So um, although it's just our Virginia plan, I think the components of it make sense. I do want to say responding to any of this does require a team. If there's ever bioterrorism, we need lots of people and we will be fighting over people. And I ask every district health department to please make sure you have a team of people set aside for the epi operations component of responding to any of these. We have come up with a plan that we think covers the basis to define the tasks that need to be carried out in epidemiology um, to respond to any of the, these diseases. And we've broken it down into three general groups, the surveillance group, investigation group, and health information development group. All of those have multiple components um, and have to have collaboration with others as well, certainly. So um, I want to go some into epi operations, but I also want to say at the same time, we would possibly be having uh, these points of distribution of vaccine or antibiotics. We would have a lot of concerned public calling, um, and then we would have the technical epi response to the disease. So we need teams of people for all the components of the response, um, and I just want to make sure we, we manage our resources as effectively as possible. This next slide I know has a whole lot on it. It is from our epi response plan. I encourage you to print it out for a whole page, because um, if it's on your little slide, then you're not going to be able to read it, or I encourage you to go to the epi response plan to look it over. I'm going to walk through it as quickly as I can. Um, I'm going to start from the right-hand side and move left. So this is how we've defined the components of epi operations in response to a bioterrorism event, which is also how we re would respond to any sort of uh, serious epidemiologic event. So on the far right side, we have the Enhanced Surveillance and Case Reporting Group. This is summarized to call this is surveillance. There are three key components of that, starting again on the right side, application support. We're going to need databases, so we're going to need information technology support. We're going to need the data support team where we're doing data entry and cleaning. And then we have the surveillance team that's really thinking things through, gathering lots of information, putting it together and generating reports. So this team would define our surveillance procedures. They would have a plan for data collection and dissemination, such as get all your reports submitted by 10 in the morning and we'll produce a report by 3 every afternoon. They'd have tools for data management. They could be compiling the clinical, the laboratory, the statistical data that's coming in through surveillance. They monitor other data sources, such as emergency department data and death surveillance data and generate reports, graphs, maps, etc. The middle 
section there is the EPI Investigation and Management Group, which I just am summarizing by calling investigation. And the right-hand column of that group is where we really need people in the field, on the ground. There's a lot to go on here because these are the people that are interacting one-on-one -on -one with all the sick people and their contacts. So this, these are people that are out there giving technical advice and consultation to people. We are gathering information on every sick person, collecting information. We're gathering information on all their contacts. We're monitoring any of their contacts for signs and symptoms of illness. We're referring them for follow-up care. We're potentially collecting specimens from them, getting them to the lab. We're making recommendations to them for how to prevent disease. We may be referring them for immunization or um, prophylaxis of some sort. We're going to make sure that they really receive the interventions we recommend and they're complying with it. Some of the antibiotic prophylaxis is very long term, so we have to make sure people keep taking their pills. Um, we're going to apply disease control measures like restrict their activities. Um, if they're in quarantine, we need to ensure that their essential needs are met. If we're telling them they have to stay home, we have to monitor their compliance with quarantine. If they get sick, we need to put other measures in place to keep them isolated or get them linked up with appropriate health care. So there's a lot that goes on there, which is why we say we really have to have a team. The next column to the left is investigation team. This is a smaller group that I see as the think tank where they're taking in all the information and analyzing, assessing, and interpreting it. They're saying, what is the case definition? What does this illness look like? What are we seeing that the cases have in common? What are our guidelines we should be putting out there for specimen collection and protection of lab workers? Um, what recommendations should we be making? What seems to be working? What else can we add to be more effective? Developing questionnaires, possibly developing analytic studies, bringing in all the data from the interviews of the ill and well and analyzing it to see what we're learning from it. If we can define a population at risk, if we can define a hypothesis about what might be causing the illness, we might even do studies to test that hypothesis statistically. Then the far left is the Health Information Development Group. This is packaging all this information into messages that then we can give to the risk communication or out in, in other ways to providers, um, the public, different audiences where we want to say, okay, this is what we're seeing. This is who's at risk. These are uh, recommendations for what should be done to protect yourself and prevent the spread of disease, et cetera. This is a recommendations for treatment, prophylaxis, infection control, specimen collection and handling, et cetera, et cetera, geared to different audiences. So there is a lot going on, and I beg you with no pride um, at all to please make sure we have people dedicated to this key field functions. To show you where the EPI response plan is, it's on the internal VDH website under the emergency response plan. If you go to Annex G, um, it's there. We also have a plan um, on, in this list. We have the chemical EPI response plan, the radiological nuclear response plan, isolation and quarantine guidelines, et cetera, all in this, this list. And then these are some resources for more information. On the preparedness website, we have fact sheets for each BT agent, um, as well as chemical and rad nuke uh, agents, and some more detailed guidance for providers. We maintain the disease control manual that has a whole lot of information on a whole lot of all the reportable diseases. And then again, we have the specific response plans. So I thank you for your attention. I gave you a lot of information, and I ran through it as quickly as I can. Um, and I just thank you. That's all. Nancy. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Willard, for your informative, I must say, masterfully organized <laughs> presentation. Uh, it's a tremendous relief to know that the response steps stay the same regardless of the agent involved. Uh, so thank you very much for that bottom line. And thank you to our 130 or so viewers for tuning in. Please help us spread the word that the session is being recorded and will be archived for a future viewing. We have five minutes for questions. 
I think what we will do is uh, we'll open it region by region by region. There's time for each region to have one question. And so I'll work through the regions. Should we run out of time and it get to 11 o'clock? Send me your additional questions. I'll make a list. I'll get the responses, responses from Dr. Willard, and I'll issue to you in the near future uh, FAQ handout. So at the Madison Building, let's hear from you first. Any questions from the Madison Building? They're my friends, and so they're being kind to me. <laughs> no questions here. Moving right along, Central Region. Any questions you would like to raise with Dr. Willard? Southwest. Questions from Southwest. I think I must have been clear as a bell. Or else, you know, everybody's heard of these agents. I did think that I was trying to present it in a, a new way with a disease transmission cycle, but um, I know that, that a lot of people have heard of the BT agents many times before. Well, what's very valuable is that your PowerPoint presentation in and of itself is a reference guide. We're all going to, to keep it and keep it close. So thank you very much. Any other questions from Eastern? Hey, Diane, it's Dave Kay. I was hey there. wondering, have we, have we seen any viral hemorrhagic fever uh, cases in Virginia in the last 10 years or so? No, we haven't had any cases in a forever. Let me see if I wrote a note. We, we don't see these diseases. We actually did um, recently get a call on the Epiphone about um, a person who was potentially exposed on an airplane to a case that was confirmed in Minnesota. Um, and so one of our health departments in the eastern region did have to track down this person who was on the plane, um, but it turned out they were just fine and that they didn't even live in Virginia after all. But no, these are very, very rare. We do not get these diseases. But dengue fever, is that something that you've seen uh, along the yes. southern part of the eastern seaboard? <laughs> yeah, how, actually how we do we do get dengue we do get dengue fever and even some dengue hemorrhagic fever in the, the state. So we might get an imported dengue hemorrhagic fever. Um, these, it is coming in more um, dingy, not necessarily the hemorrhagic form, but it is a potential di disease that can occur here. Last but not least, Northern Region. Do you have any questions for Dr. Willard? Nancy, good, good morning. It's Mark in Fairfax. Uh, Dr. Willard referred to anthrax and said that public health is responsible for, for decon. What exactly was she, was she referring to? Yeah, what I was thinking of was the biohazard detection system plan where we would be supporting the Postal Service so that if there was a letter that had anthrax spores in it and the spores were released in the post office, the post office would be doing the decontamination of their workers and giving out the antibiotics and we have a supportive role of any function um, that they have. So I, it was just if there was some broad scale thing where people could be um, exposed in a contained environment, then we could potentially have a decon role. Okay, thank you. With no further questions, we'll sign off now with a thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. From the mountains to the ocean and everything in between, VDH, the Virginia Department of Health, Office of Risk Communication and Education.